Delicious Deli brings you home cooking with a Remember When Deli dining experience. Located in Central Boca Raton, My Delicious Deli prepares all of their food with the freshest of ingredients cooked to order. From a light nosh and soups to omelets and full entrees, choose from low-fat and gluten-free or indulge in one of My Delicious Deli's signature deli sandwiches. Bring your family and friends to dine in or take out. Open seven days a week for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to go or for all of your catering needs. Visit us at MyDeliciousDeli.com or give us a call at 561-393-3287. There is something for everyone. Join us at 7036 West Palmetto Park Boulevard in Boca Raton, 954-393-3287. Talk health. Talk wealth. Talk politics. Talk 1470 and 95.3 FM WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to How to Stay Healthy, where we interview doctors each week across the vast medical landscape of cardiology, neurology, orthopedics, sports medicine, and primary care. Join us here for your prescription to better health. Good evening. My name is Patty Villa, and you are listening to How to Stay Healthy. David's off this evening, and this show is sponsored by All County Healthcare. If you want to get in contact with them, please call 561-558-4720. Our first guest is Dr. Nuria Lawson, and she is with Palmetto General Hospital. She's a general surgeon, and she's absolutely amazing, and I'm quite honored that she's uh, had the time to be on the show today. Dr. Lawson, how are you today? I'm just fine, Patty. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I know that a subject that you and I have worked on a lot is breast cancer, and a lot of people are always asking, what exactly is breast cancer? Well, breast cancer is actually the um, most common serious cancer that affects women. It's not the number one cause of cancer death that dishonor is uh, goes to lung cancer, but it is the second cause of cancer death for women in the United States. Um, it is very frequent, but we are making a lot of inroads in survival and in understanding the disease and being able to take care of it and personalize it patient to patient. And what is it that causes breast cancer? Because I know a lot of people don't understand that. So can you talk us through that? So the highest risk is to be a woman and to have breasts and to have the hormones in the woman's body affect the breast tissue. Estrogen and progesterone is the number one identifying factors with breast cancer. Certainly men can have breast cancer. Certainly people on both extremes of both ages uh, very young or very old can get cancer, but the majority of women that get, get breast cancer have been alive for 40 to 50 years with the breast being washed in hormones, and the hormones stimulate some cells to suddenly become rogue and uh, change and become uh, invasive and aggressive, and those are the ones we call cancer. And usually there's a hormonal cause to it, not always. And when should men and women test for breast cancer? Well, what women should be doing is screening, certainly, for any changes. Um, We're at a point that we're not just looking for breast cancer. We're looking for anything that indicates the woman is at a higher risk of getting breast cancer, either because she has a tissue that is scary or she has changes on any imaging, either mammograms or sonograms or sometimes even MRIs. There are also people that family history is significant for a higher risk of getting breast cancer. And then we need to test them for a genetic risk to get breast cancer. Also, we also want to be sure that the patient doesn't have any suspicious findings that indicate she already has or he, you know, one out of every 100 patients with breast cancer is a man. Um, so she or he have already have breast cancer. And something that you and I have talked about is the path that Angelina Jolie uh, took. 
um, yeah. because she thought that she, because of hereditary reasons, thought that she would be, um, you know, exposed to breast cancer. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? If, if there's people sure. that are listening that perhaps are sure. thinking about taking that path? Sure. Sure. The, the reason she uh, got tested for the gene is because her mother died when she was in her 30s of breast cancer. So right off the bat, the number one most um, uh, suspicious thing in a patient's family history that might make us look into doing a genetic testing is if there's a first-line family member with uh, breast, a history of breast cancer, either the mother or the sister's. And when the patient has that, then the next thing is how old was that person when they were diagnosed? If it was great-grandma who was diagnosed at age 89, that's okay. That's, she probably got the breast cancer because of her old age. But if your mother had breast cancer in her 30s, that is concerning for a gene running, running in the family. If one or two siblings had breast cancer, that is highly concerning for a genetic uh, risk. If uh, one of the family members had ovarian cancer at any age, grandmother, mother, sisters, any ovarian cancer, immediately you should be tested for the gene. Um, any male in the family who had breast cancer, there you have a very high risk of having a gene running in the family. Or if somebody in the family had breast cancer in both breasts, bilateral breast cancer. Those are the things that tip us off, and we recommend the genetic testing, which is very simple. It's a saliva test. You uh, rinse with mouthwash, and you spit in a little tube, and we send that out, and within three weeks, we will know not only if you have the BRCA gene, BRCA1 or BRCA2, which is what Angelina Jolie ended up having, but nowadays we test for about maybe 20 to 30 different genes besides that to see if you have any rarer form of genetic uh, mutation. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, because everybody likes to drink wine and everybody mm -hmm. likes to have their cocktail, and something that I've heard you say over and over again is our intake of alcohol and different fruit foods and how can we help um, you know, with the situation of breast cancer and maybe other diseases. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The, the World Health Organization has identified several frequent cancers whose risk is increased by consuming alcohol. This is the sad news I have to tell to everybody out there who likes a little <laughs> glass of wine with their fine dining like I do, just <laughs> one little glass of wine. The reality is that alcohol is toxic for us. And it, for women in particular, one glass of booze, of any type of alcohol, not just necessarily wine, any type of alcohol, one glass a day increases your risk by 7%. Two glasses a day increases your risk exponentially to 20%. I know right now your listenings are all clicking off the, the radio. They don't want to hear any more. No, they don't. But the, the, the reality is that you, you can enjoy, indulge in moderation, and moderation nobody has established what is the safe level, but myself, I would drink one or two glasses a week, that's it, in the weekends. And then, of course, if you're going to indulge in one or two glasses, that's it, then it's going to be the, the good stuff. Get the top-tier wine bottle, none of that uh, <laughs> cheapy wine. And so you might as well enjoy it. But I would hesitate before I drink one glass of wine every day. I would recommend your listeners to think about this, all the studies that come out, uh, studying the relationship of alcohol with breast cancer, all of them point with an increased risk of breast cancer with daily consumption of alcohol. And Dr. Lawson, I want to remind everybody that you are at Palmetto General Hospital, which is located at 2001 West 68th Street. And if anybody wants to get a hold of Dr. Lawson, who is an amazing surgeon at our hospital, please call 1-844-790-7313. Dr. Lawson, lastly, any tips you want to give to us about exercising? Well, certainly. Exercise... The increase in race, rate of breast cancer parallels the increase in rates of obesity in America. And it's because the excess fat in our body gets converted to estrogen. So fatter women have 
much higher levels of hormones in their bodies. And it's as if we were giving hormone shots to women. So these women have a higher risk of getting breast cancer. Exercise is very important. Maintaining a healthy weight is very important. And if you lower your weight and you do 30 minutes of exercise a day, you will know you will sustain a decrease in the risk of developing breast cancer. Certainly that's measurable. Before you go and spend money on organic foods, which is also healthy but has not been proven to prevent breast cancer. Has not. No matter what Dr. Google says, right. organic non-organic food is not or pesticides or contact is not. If you're going to do anything health-wise, forget juicing, forget it. It's good, but nothing has been proven like losing weight and exercising 30 minutes a day. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. And I want you to know I'm trying to do all, I'm trying to take all your advice and do exactly what you're telling all of us to do. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. You're very welcome. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. We're going to take a short break right now. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Dr. Luis Perez Alonso, the medical director in the emergency room from North Shore Medical Center. How to stay healthy. It's a question asked by many people and answered by few. On how to stay healthy with David DePino, I'm going to bring you the latest in health news by interviewing top doctors from South Florida and around the world. Tune in on Fridays at 5.30 p.m. right here on WWNN Radio 95.3 FM and 1470 AM, the Health and Wealth Network, to hear the latest health treatments and my curveball question of the hobbies and passions in life doctors pursue when not providing medicine. And now back to How to Stay Healthy, your weekly doctor's interview and prescription to better health. And we're waiting for our next doctor to call in, Dr. Perez Alonso, who is the medical director of North Shore Medical Center. Um, He's going to be talking about the flu because, as you know, the flu has been very prevalent across the country. Uh, We've had several adult deaths as well as uh, children that have died uh, because of the flu. And uh, that's a subject matter that was very important that we want to talk about. Um, I also wanted to mention that this show is sponsored by All County Healthcare. And if you want to get a hold of All County, All County Healthcare, please call 561-558-4720. As we're waiting for Dr. Perez Alonso to call in, I wanted to mention that uh, Tenet Hospital has five hospitals, 10 hospitals in Florida, and the five that I, that I manage are in South Florida is Palmetto General Hospital, Hialeah Hospital, North Shore Medical Center, Florida Medical Center, and Coral Gables Hospital. We have a lot of exciting things that are coming uh, this year for 2018. Coral Gables Hospital at the moment has acquired two new robots, the X and the XI. Um, We have wonderful surgeons that are working there, and we plan to do a community event in the next month, so please be following our Facebook page. Florida Medical Center also has acquired their second robot. And as a matter of fact, last night had an event where we invited all the different surgeons to to come to the event and see the, the, the robot and just do an exchange and talk about the different surgeries that can be performed. And the reason why several of the hospitals uh, here for Tenet Healthcare are rolling out the robot and doing different events is because many times, many of the doctors hear from people that call in people in the community that they think that the person that is going to be operating on them is the actual robot and since it's called robotic surgery and that is not the case the case is that there is a surgeon with their hands inside the gloves that is maneuvering the uh robot in order to conduct the surgery and it's less invasive which is very very important it's very good for the surgeon and it's very good uh for the patient right now dr Perez Alonso is on the line doctor how are you hey good afternoon how are you good Doing thank well. you for calling in i know you're a very very busy man and i'm very happy that you were able to find some time to call in um let's get right to it because as i was mentioning before waiting for you to call we, we the the flu is just all over the country we've had several deaths adult deaths uh children deaths what are the symptoms of the flu the the the, the flu um uh, always presents it's a virus right it always presents the viral symptoms 
So you get the body aches, the headaches, the fever, the chills, nausea, vomiting, all those uh, symptoms, a very, very, uh, very broad category of symptoms. But most commonly is the fever, the fever and the body aches. So, doctor, when should a person go to an, or an emergency room to see a doctor or to a doctor's office? You know, I, I, I've seen this year is, is pretty aggressive. This year the flu is pretty aggressive, and we're getting very sick people coming to the ER. Um, so my suggestion now is if you're really not feeling well, if your fever is spiking, you're getting all these symptoms, and you're not feeling well, come into the emergency department and let us take a look at you. Uh, you know, the majority of the cases of the flu do not uh, require hospitalization. You can come in. We can take a look at you. Some don't require anything uh, but just an evaluation. But uh, let us determine that. Let, it, let a medical professional determine the severity of your case. So and certainly, if you're not feeling well, you know, come, come to the hospital. And let, let me ask you this question, because I know as we work at the different hospitals, and, and you work uh, in, in, many, in two different hospitals for tenant health care, um, and we're seeing, as you mentioned, the emergency room, how full they are with uh, our people that are coming in from the community that are very ill. How can one prevent themselves, whether it's a family member, whether it's a colleague, whether, you know, it's a friend, how can you prevent yourself from getting the flu? Is there a way to do that? Well, the, the, best, the best way to prevent the flu, obviously, is getting the flu vaccine. Uh, but once you get the flu vaccine, it takes about two weeks to develop the antibodies and for your body to have the protection that's needed. Uh, so right now we're in full swing uh, flu season. So if you take it right now, you know, you're, you're still vulnerable for the next two weeks, at least, uh, for the flu. So other than that, once if you don't, if, uh, other side, aside from the vaccine, the most important thing is washing your hands very frequently, washing your hands and limiting your contact, obviously, with people who have the, the influenza. But the uh, washing hands and not sharing forks, spoons, cups, not having any any exchange of bodily fluids that that's a, that's important. Okay. Now, you are the medical director at North Shore Medical Center, and we are very lucky to have you there. I know that it's a very, very busy emergency room. Can you tell us a little bit about the cases that you've been seeing in the last few months? Sure. Well, first, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate <laughs> that. And, you know, it's, North Shore is a home to me, so I, yes. I love being there. But um, the type of cases we're seeing, you know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of the pediatric patients, a lot of young kids, and we're getting a lot of the the elderly as well, greater than 65 years of age. So um, not to mention, of course, you know, we get the wide spectrum, but those are the two most uh, abundant populations at this time. So we are seeing a lot of nursing homes uh, being afflicted with, with severe cases of flu, influenza. So you know, anytime you're in the healthcare uh, acquired, I think mean, healthcare <laughs> setting, whether it's a hospital, nursing home, assisted living facility, you know, it's easier for the um, influenza to spread. Same thing with daycare, same thing with uh, school, school settings. So we are seeing the young and the old very commonly. Yes. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, because you've been the medical director there for now uh, some time, and, you know, we had the hurricane that came by a few months ago, and now in, in a few months, in six months from now, we're going to be back into hurricane season. And North Shore did an excellent job of taking care of its, the members of the community. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of how, how it was staying at the hospital during Hurricane Irma and how we took care of those patients? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, was, it was a very rough uh, hurricane uh, season for us. That the hurricane came through, and it wasn't the actual impact of the hurricane because we know the hurricane kind of you know, went to the left a little bit, went, went, went west, but um, it did knock out power to our area. So when it knocked out power to the North Shore community, we, we dealt with a lot of the situations involving uh, people unable to get their dialysis, unable to use their uh, nebulized or, ne nebulizer machines or their breathing treatments. Uh, so, you know, we, we, took, um, we took out a large amount of people in our, in our ER who had no electricity, who needed their medical equipment, so we had that on, on top of the, addition, the regular medical emergencies. So you know, we went above and beyond, I believe, in our, in our North Shore and, and the community to kind of accommodate everyone and make sure that everyone had their care while also handling the large number of emergencies that were actually occurring on a daily basis. And, you know, you mentioned something, you mentioned diabetes, and the community that we serve in the North Shore area, uh, a lot of people in our community have diabetes. What advice is it that you can give um, the people that are listening if they think they may have diabetes, or how can they take care of themselves better? You know, the, first, the first thing is, is educating, educating yourself on diabetes. I mean, diabetes is, is a condition that can be controlled. 
as long as you're watching your diet, you're taking care of yourself, you're checking your blood sugar once you're already diagnosed, and you're taking your medications, you know, you can keep diabetes under control your whole life. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those things, though, diabetes, if it's not taken care of, it's one of the worst diseases. It can affect every organ system in your body. It can affect the eyes, the, kid, the, you know, the, eyes, the kidneys, the liver, the lung, the skin, name it. It affects the entire body if you do not control it. So, you know, diabetes is, is important. You know, if, you're, if you're concerned, if you have a family history, uh, you know, you can go down to the pharmacy. They actually sell the machines, but you do need a prescription for the little Lancets. You can check your own sugar at home if that's the case, or you come into the emergency department, you get to a hospital, your primary care doctor, urgent care center, any of those locations, and get your blood sugar checked and screened. Now, you can't make a diagnosis of diabetes with just one-time uh, blood sugar check unless it's severely elevated. But, uh, you know, it's something to keep an eye on for sure. And one of the other things that I wanted to talk about, and one of the things that we've talked about throughout the year is, you know, Memorial uh, Day is coming, 4th of July, and it doesn't even have to be a holiday in order for people to play or to shoot off their fireworks. And I know that you have seen very extreme cases of people that have been hurt while using the fireworks. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, we, t- we tend to see some of these severe injuries every single year. Um, and so it's all about firework safety. It's about safety. You really, you really have to watch what you're doing. And the, number one, you shouldn't be handling any of these dangerous fireworks to begin with. But if you do, make sure you're keeping yourself at a distance. You, know, you, you try to light it from a distance. And do not, do not let your kids around, please. We've, seen, we've had some injuries where the kids are exposed or involved in the environment. Um, so please, you know, fireworks are very dangerous. They're not all you know, manufactured properly and safely. And anytime, if you, even if you're using fire safety uh, to light it properly, it can still backfire on you. So please be careful when you're yes. lighting your fireworks. We've seen too many injuries. That's right. And, that, and that's why I wanted to, you to mention that because you know firsthand uh, the injuries that, that people come into the ER with. Um, The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, some people in our community don't understand the relationship between the hospital and the EMS. So can you talk uh, about how we're connected and how we we work to take care of the people in our community? Oh, absolutely. I mean, EMS is a a partner of ours. You know, every hospital is partnered up with the the EMS personnel. And that doesn't necessarily mean a direct partnership where it's working for the same company. But, you know, they all play a very big role in what we do and how we function. You know, there, there are eyes and ears to the community. So if anybody's really ill, they have to know the resources that are available at each facility. So they know that at North Shore, we can treat the heart attacks, we can treat the strokes. So they know they bring those patients to us in a timely manner is important. So, you know, they also know that we, have, we, we support them, their efforts, their edu- education. So, you know, EMS plays a big role, not only for the hospital, but for the patients in the community. I mean, there's just some people who are, you know, alone and the first person that arrives to their home is going to be the EMS personnel. So they, they, they play a great role uh, in our community. Yes. And can you, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about when they come in, what is it that takes place? Right. The EMS personnel comes into our, our emergency department. You know, they come right in. We try to greet them as soon as possible, greet the patient, and uh, try to determine exactly what's going on, what's, what the uh, patient complaint is. So we try to find them a bed as soon as possible, try to get the patient in. Uh, so that way, EMS, the patient can be seen faster, but also the EMS can get back out into the community and take care of the next person, uh, the next emergency that's, that's uh, you know, it's pending. pending. Right. Um, yeah. Dr. Perez Alonso, can you talk a little bit about the relationship that we have with our A-team and our administration, our CEO, Manny Linares, who does an incredible job of navigating and, and being the leader of, of our hospital and how important it is for, you know, the staff to have that great connection and partnership with uh, the CEO and the A-team? No, absolutely. I mean, every, everything is teamwork, right? I mean, we, we can, I can have a wish list of things to accomplish in the emergency department, but if I don't have the support of the administration, of Mr. Linares, uh, of, of our entire entire team in the hospital, it's not going to happen. I mean, it, it, takes, it takes the whole team to, to make things happen in that, that emergency department. Uh, so yeah, it's just the, re- the resources, the support, New concepts, new ideas, things that we try to do there. You know, it takes really a lot of people to make it to make it happen. And you know, fortunately at North Shore we have uh, a great A team. They've been there for a long time, seasoned, experienced, and they've dealt with uh, everything you can throw at them basically in the community. So, yeah, it's a great great team at North Shore. That's very true, and that's why I wanted to talk talk about each point that I asked you about because I've been fortunate. You know, I'm fortunate that I get to work with you and I get to work with them. 
Um, they do great work. I, when I walk through the emergency room and I see 30 or 40 people waiting to be seen uh, out there, you know, that whether it's with dialysis or their diabetes or someone comes in, whatever the case may be, you and your staff do an excellent job of, of just passing people through very quickly, taking care of them very quickly, analyzing what their situation is. And we're very fortunate to have us in your, in, in the community. I wanted to ask you, what was your passion? Why did you want to become a doctor? Well, specifically, uh, emergency medicine has always been my passion, medicine in general, but emergency medicine, just since I was younger. You know, I was an EMT, paramedic. I love watching the show ER. <laughs> it's just, it's just the, uh, the, the rush, the adrenaline, the ability to help people, the fast pace. Uh, it's just one of those things that I've always enjoyed, uh, and I still love it. It's still a passion. You know, it's, it's, I love interacting with the people every single day and making a difference. So it's it's you know it's, one, it's just a passion, <laughs> and and I know it runs a little bit in the family because you told me that your sister uh, is in medicine as well. Right, she's actually an ER nurse. Uh, my wife is an ER nurse as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it runs in the family. It runs in the family, and you know, talk, talking about you know, you spend so much time in the ER. Is there one case in particular that comes to mind of so a patient that you treated? It, it, it's not really one case. I say a group of cases. It's it's always the pediatric cases that that touch us the most, that leave the biggest impact. You know, you you hate to see a one year old, five year old in, in distress, in cardiac arrest, or not breathing, whatever the emergency may be. And we we've had we see several of these at North Shore and, and in our community. So it's always the pediatric patients that that leave an impact. You know, it's the it's the most um, it, you know, it, it's the most touching. You know, you, you leave there and you, you go home and you hold your family tighter because you just, it's just a rough, rough situation to deal with. Well, thank you, Dr. Perez Alonso, for being on the show today. Thank you for taking the time because I know you're out with your family. So I'm really happy that you were oh, able to call in and me. talk about all these points. Dr. Perez Alonso is the medical director of the emergency room at North Shore Medical Center at 1100 Northwest 95th Street. And if you want to get a hold of North Shore Medical Center, you can call 1-800-984-3434. And please remember that this show is sponsored by All County Healthcare. And you can call All County Healthcare at 561 55 I wish you all a wonderful and blessed weekend. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. For a prescription to better health from the top doctors in the medical fields of cardiology, neurology, orthopedics, sports medicine, and primary care, join us each week on the How to Stay Healthy Show. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management,